Vampires, night-lurking creatures that prey on our deepest fears at the margin between life and death. Fiction and fantasy have molded our perception of these night stalkers, but what is the truth behind the myth of the vampire? Vampires were somewhere between a nuisance and a danger. Uh, they could curdle the milk in your cows, they could steal your sheep, uh, they could physically attack you or, or your family. Now, forensics, medicine, and science are uniting to expose the facts behind the fiction. Natural changes of decomposition can build into the appearance of the vampire, the living dead. They're proving vampires are much more than simple horror stories. The stakes were placed there deliberately to stop this man from transforming himself. For some people, Vampires are still a terrifying reality. I saw him coming at night. He was sucking my blood. This is my pitchfork. I used it to remove his heart. To unlock the secrets of the vampire, we'll travel across Europe and beyond and find proof that could even upgrade vampires from creatures of legend to historical fact. In 1997, a mysterious boat slowly floated its way into Whitby Harbour on the northeast coast of England. Everyone on board was either missing or dead. The very instant the shore was touched, an immense dog sprang up on deck from below and, running forward, jumped from the bow onto the sand. Making straight for the steep cliff where the churchyard hangs over the laneway, it disappeared into the darkness, which seemed intensified just beyond the focus of the searchlight. With these words, Bram Stoker's infamous vampire, Dracula, was introduced to the world and entered the popular psyche. Everything, everything about vampires is in Count Dracula. The archetypal image of the vampire as we now know it. But where did Stoker's tale of gothic horror originate? And could there be a real-life figure behind his creation? Vampires exist in every culture. China's Shang-Chi, Yaramayahu from Australia, the Indian Azrapa, the Jaracaca of Brazil, or the many European incarnations such as the Strix, Strigoi, Vricolacas, Revenant, Upir, Vampir, Dracul. Such creatures predate the Bible, yet they weren't just myths, they were very real. Reanimated corpses that feed on the living to prevent their own decay. Dan Jones is an author and historian with a particular interest in society's portrayal of vampires. There have always been vampire stories in Europe, but it really comes to a head in the 18th century when the Hunch theologian Calme starts putting together a dossier of vampire tales, actually in an attempt to debunk vampire myths. Unfortunately, what that does is give vampire stories legitimacy because they're being engaged with by the sort of scientific men of the, of the age. By the turn of the 19th century, the vampire myth starts feeding into Gothic literature. And so you have Polidori, who starts writing The Vampire. That's really the template for what Bram Stoker does when he writes Dracula. And every time you have the vampire story reinvented, it totally reflects the preoccupations and the concerns of the society that's reinventing it. In the 20th century, you have Nosferatu, and there's a kind of strain of anti-Semitism in it. In Hammer Horror, the vampire story is a lot more bloody, it's a lot more violent. In Anne Rice's interview with a vampire, you have a real undercurrent of homosexuality. And when you get to Blade, say, in the late 90s, there's this sort of high-tech futurism that, again, characteristic of that society. And fictional vampires continue to reflect our morality today. If you look at the 21st century, the Twilight movies and books, the vampire is the geek, but actually there's a beautiful story in there as well. I mean, that's totally 21st century morals all over.
Preying on our ethics was no doubt at the forefront of Stoker's mind when he dreamt up Dracula. Is this cemetery where the Count first bites Lucy Westenra, this very pure 19-year-old virgin? Now, she eventually transforms into a sort of lusty vampire herself who terrorises North London, biting young children. And it's this mixture of sex and scandal that Stoker was doing pretty deliberately to titillate and to scare and to shock his audience, and probably to help build his sales figures at the same time. Bram Stoker's Dracula is so successful, it hasn't been out of print for over a century. Yet, unlike Stoker's Count, the real-life vampires of history were not charismatic gentlemen with a black cape, mesmerising stare and a penchant for nubile young women. The vampires of the Greek folklore were not glamorous uh, like the Hollywood vampire. They were bloated corpses that spread on diseases. You're not going to get people swooning uh, over uh, deformed Mediterranean peasants slobbering along, biting chunks out of your breast. Now, recent discoveries on a small Greek island are revealing who these creatures really were and what it took to become one. Professor Hector Williams has been conducting archaeological research on the Greek island of Lesbos for over 30 years. But it was in 1988 that he made a discovery that could put flesh onto the stories of vampires. standing on top of the ancient city wall of Mytilene. For five seasons, with more than 40 workmen, we dug on both sides of it and around it. Dozens of discoveries emerged. A Roman brothel over there, a Hellenistic industrial district down here, pottery from the age of Sappho 600 years before Christ down below. But nothing prepared us for the remarkable discovery we were going to make at the far end of the wall built actually into the wall itself. It was a discovery that shook the very foundations of archaeology. Proof that vampires may not just be creatures of legend, but of historical fact. We're here on the edge of the ancient city wall, and it was at this point that we discovered the wall had been cut into and a crypt very carefully excavated in which a wooden coffin had been lowered and heavy stones placed on top. For some reason, somebody had gone to the huge effort of digging a grave right into the foundations of the city walls. But that wasn't the only mystery. It stretched along here for about two meters, and in it were sprawling the remains of a middle-aged man, a creature our students nicknamed Vlad after Vlad the Impaler. Vlad the Impaler was a 15th century ruler of Romania and was probably the inspiration for Bram Stoker's Dracula. And like his counterpart, Hector's Vlad came to a sticky end. He had spikes driven through his throat, his middle, and his ankles to hold him in the tomb. This is not a normal burial. A corpse nailed into his coffin three 20 centimeter long metal stakes driven through his body into his ankle, pelvis, and neck. This was unique. We found over 50 burials in this area of men and women, and this one had received very special treatment, the treatment of a suspected vampire. So who was Vlad, and why was he considered to be a vampire? Hector turned to Greek-born paleopathologist Anastasia Tseliki for answers. She found that far from the fanged figure of fiction, this vampire was surprisingly ordinary. He was Mr. Average, but for some reason upon his death, the villagers believed that he would become a vampire or a revenant. So when he did die, they took every measure they could in order to prevent him from striking back at the living. 
Aged 40 to 50 years, Vlad had been fit and strong. He was probably a laborer and he had eaten a decent diet. But for some reason, when he died, he didn't get a normal burial. Instead, he'd been nailed into a crude coffin and hidden right inside the city walls. But why was he treated in such a way? He may have had some characteristics that made him suspect in his lifetime, uh, so they weren't taking any chances. This was a man that they did not want to see again, alive or dead. Why were the locals so scared of Vlad? And why was he considered to be a vampire? Clues may lie a thousand miles to the west beneath a quintessential English parish church. St. Leonard's Church in Hythe in southern England is a church with a secret. Paleopathologist Anastasia Saliki has come here not to marvel at its grand stained glass windows, but to pay homage to a clandestine space beneath the chancel. A crypt containing the bones of over 4,000 people. A place that may hold clues to the origins of vampire belief. There are many theories about who these people were. Some say that the, they were the victims of a great battle, uh, others that they were the victims of the Black Death. But recent studies have found soil inside some of the skulls, so we believe that these were ordinary citizens of Hythe. And in the 13th century, when the church needed to be expanded, they were dug up from the churchyard and they were brought here. There's nothing unusual about this. Bone creeps like these existed all over Europe, and it was not rare for the bones to be dug up and put in uh, ossuaries or crypts. 40 miles south of Prague in the Czech Republic, the Church of All Saints in the town of Kutnahura has taken the idea of bone crypts to the extreme. Known as the Sedlec Ossery, this is the largest bone tomb in Europe and holds the remains of up to 70,000 people. Originally a simple pile of bones dug up from the graveyard, like those in Hythe, when the church was extended in the 14th century, it wasn't until the 1870s that it took on this macabre, gothic display. There are four enormous bell-shaped mounds in each corner of the chapel, and a colossal chandelier containing at least one of every bone in the human body, hanging from the center of the nave. The dead don't necessarily stay buried forever. In many cultures, they dig up the bodies and they keep uh, the bones in a, a mausoleum, a family grave, or an ossuary. Although rarely as ornate, bone crypts and mausoleums are still commonplace the world over. My family has its own burial plot on a small island in Greece, so one day I hope that my bones will be transferred there so that I can rest alongside my ancestors. Back on Lesbos, Hector Williams is visiting a modern day cemetery to see whether this practice of relocating the bones could explain the ancient Greeks' belief in vampires. Sign in the village cemetery mentions, because of the small size of the second cemetery of Mytilene, we ask relatives of the deceased to proceed with the exhumation of their relatives in timely fashion after three years post-mortem. Even today, bones are being exhumed to free up space for new burials. We're here by a modern grave in the cemetery, one that will soon be exhumed and the body placed in a box and transferred to the charnel house. You can see part of a leg bone coming out of the ground. 
Um, there's a backbone here. There's a bit of rib uh, coming up there with flesh still on it. And very conspicuous at the end of the grave is the skull. So, could a familiarity with the remains of the dead have led to a belief in the undead? The problem started when something unexpected happened. For example, uh, when the villagers went to dig up the body to transfer the bones, and instead of the skeleton, they found a corpse looking fresh. To them, there were only two solutions. Either that was the body of a saint, or they were dealing uh, with the work of the devil. And in this case, they thought they were dealing with uh, a vampire or a revenant. But. Could there be a more natural explanation for the lack of decay? Popular misconception is that a body will decompose quite fast after death. But in fact, nothing could be further from the truth. Professor Richard Shepherd is one of the UK's leading pathologists, a forensics expert and a real-life CSI. He even advises the British government on mysterious deaths. The speed at which a body does decompose depends on the state of the body at the time of death and the ground in which the body is buried. The body normally contains millions and millions of bacteria. Mostly they're beneficial to the body and help in digestion and help to an extent in protecting the body against infection. Of course, after death, there's nothing left for these bacteria to feed on and they'll start to digest the body itself. This is the natural process of decay, the body's bacteria given the freedom to feed. And the result would normally be a pile of bones ready to be moved into the ossuary or mausoleum. But they had to be cleaned first. People in the past did not necessarily know the connection between the spread of bacteria and disease. However, the ritualized treatment of the bones gave them a way to protect the living from the spread of contagion. Uh, washing bones uh, with wine, for example, has been known to act as a disinfectant since Hippocrates' time 2,500 years ago. Through the ritualized treatment of the bones, the Greeks were literally protecting themselves from the dead a process that could have lent favour to the tales of vampires. In many areas in Greece, they used boiled wine and vinegar as a defence against the vampires or revenants, and this might have something to do with the disinfectant properties of these substances. And there are other features of decomposition that can also substantiate the idea of the living dead. Sometimes a corpse might even move inside the grave. One of the things that occurs to a body after death is a natural process, rigor mortis, the stiffening of the muscles after death. Some people believe it affects the body permanently, but that's not true. It's a temporary process. And as the body relaxes, it may cause it to appear to move within the coffin. And if there's movement there, it may also cause noises to come out of the coffin as well. And this could give the impression that the body's arising from the dead. And even the look of the corpse could portray it as a vampire. After death, the skin of the body dries out, dehydrates and shrinks a bit. And this can give the impression that stubble is growing on the face. Blisters form and the top surface of the skin can peel off and slip off. And the fingernails are growing, sometimes to a considerable length, and they can curve a little like a claw. And this can give the impression that the body is still alive, hair is still growing, fingernails are still growing. So it's perhaps no surprise that Hollywood has taken these three natural signs of decomposition, the facial hair growth, the long fingernails and the smooth skin, as being signs of the continuing life of this vampire after death. But what you get when you see these vampire stories, especially with like the blood around the mouth, the rosy cheeks, these bodies apparently not decomposing as they should, according to science, is you're pushing the boundaries of what science and what medicine, you know, the cutting edge of the day, can explain. I think that's one reason, I think that's the prime reason why people just go so mad for these vampire stories. 
and were they then to drive a stake through the heart, that would tend to expel the gases that are developed in the body after death, make the body fart. It could certainly cause it to sigh. And this would, of course, reinforce their belief that this body had, in fact, been alive all the time. So, ignorance of the body's decomposition cycle when it came to transferring the remains to the ossuary or mausoleum could offer evidence that vampires are real. Might this suggest a rationale for the stakes driven through the body of Vlad on the island of Lesbos? Greece has a long tradition of vampire or revenant mythology. In the 17th to 19th century, European travelers would recount stories of how suspected vampires were exhumed and nailed inside their caskets in order to prevent them from rise again. And I think that's exactly what they found in the case of Vlad. Here was a poor man who, for whatever reason, had been assumed to be a vampire. So when he died, he was treated as such with stakes driven through his body. They took a number of precautions to make sure that this man did not return from the dead. They put the stakes through him. They put the wooden sarcophagus around him. Uh, they built the special crypt for him. They put the heavy stones on top of the crypt to make sure that the coffin could not be opened. There was a reason, and we'll never know the reason, that they thought this man was a threat to the living, that he was a potential vampire. Vlad's discovery shook the archaeological world and confirmed that vampires were real. But why Vlad was considered to be a vampire remains little more than supposition. It's likely they thought he was a vampire because of his behavior in his lifetime. There are a dozen reasons why one might have been thought to be a vampire. Strange behavior on your part, strange family history, particular evil reputation, a mistake the priest might have made in the burial. There are all sorts of reasons we don't know why they thought this particular man was a vampire. We may never know for sure. But another, even more mysterious grave was soon to be found on Lesbos, one that could provide the answers. At the turn of the 21st century, beside the tiny church of Taxiarchus, High above Vlad's grave in the city walls of Mytilene, a second mysterious burial was unearthed, one that may explain what it took to become a vampire. 1999, a team from the Greek Archaeological Service was restoring this medieval chapel. They were digging a drainage ditch around it, came across a series of burials running down the hill. One up here, perfectly normal. One here, somewhat deformed individual with two 16-centimeter stakes laid out on either side of him. It was these stakes that provided the first clues that this burial was unique. The stakes found inside the grave were too big to be coffin nails. And there is no sign that they were attached to anything. So I believe that they were placed there deliberately as a preventive measure to stop this man from transforming itself to a vampire. Just like Vlad, who had been treated as a vampire when he died, with stakes driven through his body, here lay a man who it was expected would also rise from the grave. So why didn't the locals go through with the necessary action of staking him in place at the time of his funeral? They weren't taking any chances, so they very carefully, uh, after wrapping him in his winding sheet, uh, buried him within 24 hours of, uh, of death in the usual Christian way, facing the east for the, the last judgment. As a precaution, they put these two spikes beside him. Uh, why they didn't put them through him to keep him in there, we will never know, but they were there 
and they were intended to, we think, act as talismans to keep him in the grave. Whilst the true nature of the Taxiarchus vampire remains unclear, a discovery on the other side of the world may reveal the purpose of these talisman stakes. In 1988, in the city of Mytilene on the Greek island of Lesbos, Hector Williams and his team of archaeologists unearthed the remains of a vampire they named Vlad, his body nailed into his grave. Ten years later, a second vampire was exhumed in a churchyard just a few miles out of town. These two finds have helped elevate the vampires of Eastern Europe from mythical beings to ones of historical fact. But why would someone be considered a vampire in the first place? Clues may lie on the other side of the world. In 1990, a series of shocking discoveries terrified a sleepy American town in New England. Archaeologists working on a gravel pit unearthed a necropolis dating back nearly 300 years to the time of the Founding Fathers. The cemetery contained the remains of an entire family, but one burial plot was distinct. Bearing the initials JB, when the coffin lid was opened, the archaeologists found that the bones had been rearranged into the sign of the skull and cross, was this a pirate, or could there be a more startling explanation? Forensic scientist Anastasia Saliki has been re-examining the case for clues, and to see if the find can be linked in any way to the vampires of Lesbos Island. When the bones were first studied, it soon became clear that there was a series of lesions present. The appearance, the distribution, and the location of the lesions pointed out towards one disease, and that's tuberculosis, also known as TB. So the disease would have spread from the poor man's lungs onto his ribcage, and almost certainly it is what killed him. Tuberculosis is a terrible disease that was rife in Eastern America in the 18th and 19th centuries, a period known to coincide with the spate of vampiric activity. So, could there be a connection between tuberculosis and vampires? There are a number of symptoms of tuberculosis that can be linked to vampirism. For instance, conjunctivitis, the red and inflamed eyes that often make people dislike going out in bright sunlight or there's the, the pallor of the skin associated with anemia of the disease, or the thin and thready pulse that's just associated with the debility of tuberculosis. Then, of course, there's the fact that people with tuberculosis are commonly coughing up blood. So, yes, I can understand there's an argument for linking the symptoms of tuberculosis, which was also known as consumption, with the features of vampirism. Of course, these diseases are highly contagious, so they'll stick within a family group. And so when one member of the family has died, it's quite likely that other members of the family will die soon after. Those who were infected would lose their health slowly. So it would appear as if life was drained away from them and that they were wasting away. I believe that this person died from tuberculosis and his family caught the disease as well and soon followed him to the grave. That JB's family members died so soon after him was a sure sign that he had become a vampire. And as the disease spread, hysteria may have gripped the community. There might have been an inclination to dig up the corpse and undertake the appropriate precautionary action. And there could have been other indicators of vampire activity, thanks to the volume of people dying at the time. 
when many people are dying, this will lead to rapid burials, burials in shallow graves. And in the digging of those graves, other bodies will be disturbed, lead to scattering of the bones, maybe even body parts on the surface or protruding from the grave. And this appearance could give the impression that the bodies are becoming alive again and rising from the dead. It may have been quite natural to take safety measures, to rebury the remains, to weigh them down with stones or a heavy casket, or to stake them into the grave to stop them rising again. Or perhaps in the case of JB, of simply rearranging his bones. By rearranging the bones, they may have believed that they were immobilizing the corpse in the grave and that they were preventing it from coming out again. And there is one further nail in the coffin to link tuberculosis to vampires. 50 miles away, in an abandoned cemetery in Rhode Island, lays a gravestone from 1841. It bears the inscription, in memory of Simon Whipple, who died May the 6th, 1841. Although consumption's vampire grasp has seized that mortal frame. Consumption is another name for tuberculosis. So maybe this is the proof of the link between tuberculosis and vampires, in New England at least. And the link even made it into the popular literature of the time. Francois-Marie Arouet, better known as Voltaire, was one of the greatest thinkers of the 18th century Enlightenment, and he wrote in his philosophical dictionary that vampires are corpses who went out of their graves at night to suck the blood of the living, either at their throats or stomachs, after which they returned to their cemeteries. The person so sucked waned, grew pale, and fell into consumption, while the sucking corpses grew fat, got rosy, and enjoyed an excellent appetite. Proof that in earlier times, when people's understanding of disease and illness was limited, superstition held sway over fearful minds. Fine for the 18th century, but you'd be wrong if you thought that a belief in vampires had died out today. In February 2004, the authorities were called in to the small village of Craiova, southwest Romania, to investigate six people alleged to have impaled the body of a villager, Tom Petra, who, according to them, had transformed himself into a vampire after his death. My brother-in-law died, and when he died, he became a vampire. The villagers believed that Petra was returning from the grave and feasting on his next of kin. I saw him coming at night. He was calling. I was screaming. He was sucking our blood. His relatives were gradually fading away. I had stomach ache, I turned yellow. Everybody in the neighborhood witnessed how bad I was feeling at night. In Slavic society, it is still believed that a person's spirit lingers for 40 days after death. So there was only one solution. Six weeks after his funeral, as midnight approached, Petra's family snuck into the cemetery and dug up his corpse. Its condition confirmed their worst suspicions. We found him with his hands at his side like this. His neck was torn and his mouth was full of blood. A corpse full of blood, a sure sign that Petra had become a vampire. Blood has a symbolism in many religions. There's the drinking of wine to symbolize Jesus' blood in Christianity, but there's also the drinking of blood to gain supernatural powers in many other religions. And so the presence of blood around the mouth must have been truly terrifying. The villagers did what their beliefs required. <laughs> We worked inside the grave, and we did everything properly. This is my pitchfork. We used it to remove the heart. And a dead man's heart is not supposed to have blood in it if he isn't a vampire.
So we burn it and we drank the ashes together with water. We drank the ashes and immediately we felt better. In Romania, at least, the vampire is no legend. It remains a very real threat, a night-lurking creature that preys on our deepest fears in the margin between life and death. Vampires, entities that prey on your life force, creatures of the night that lurk in the borders between life and death. Modern medicine can explicate at least some vampire cases. But what of Vlad and the other vampires of Lesbos Island? It fell on Anastasia Seliki to examine the remains of the Taxiarchus vampire. She discovered that he was no Mr. Average, as Vlad had been. The person found in the Taxiarchus grave um, had severe facial deformities, especially in the area of the nose and the jaws. And there was evidence of disease, like lesions on the skull, uh, probably a fungal infection to the brain. What I think we have here is a poor, uh, diseased and deformed man. We know from folklore that uh, people with TB, rabies or deformities were thought to become vampires after death. And uh, this is exactly what happened in this case. The physical condition might have made people suspicious of him, uh, added to outrageous behavior on his part, strange behavior on his part. The presence of the stakes does indicate a suspected revenant. So they weren't taking any chances when he was buried. They put the stakes in and covered him up and so he remained till the fall of 1999 when we uncovered him. But why didn't they drive their stakes home, as they had done with the earlier discovered Vlad? Maybe they were squeamish. Uh, maybe they thought it was just enough to have them there as a, a sort of guardian of the grave. Fearing he would rise again, the locals placed their vampire stakes beside him in the coffin. But Anastasia thinks these stakes may have had a practical purpose, too. The spikes inside the grave were sharp, and uh, as the body swell during the composition, they would have pierced the flesh, and they would uh, have released all the internal gases. By releasing the gases built up during decay, the internal organs would have been exposed, and the corpse would have dried out. That speeded up the rate of the decay. So after that, if somebody wanted to dig up the body, they would find only bones, no vampire. And to me, this shows that the locals were taking no chances. There is one final twist to the story of Vampire Island. During his research over the last 30 years, Hector Williams has become fascinated by the writings of one of the area's most famous travel authors, Charles Thomas Newton. In the 1860s, Charles Newton, who had been British Vice Consul at Medellini, published his memoirs, Travels and Discoveries in the Levant. And he refers at one place to an island near Mytilene. In Mytilene, the bones of those who will not lie quiet in their graves are transported to a small adjacent island where they are reinterred. This is an effective bar against all future vagaries, for the vampire cannot cross salt water. It's an intriguing clue, a written text from a respected author telling of a small island near Mytilene, containing not one vampire, but a whole vampire cemetery, thanks to the vampire's fear of salt water. In Bram Stoker's classic Gothic novel, Dracula, the Count comes all the way from Transylvania by sea, traveling in a coffin which is filled with his native soil. And that is a tradition that Stoker had taken from Eastern European stories about vampires. In fact, the vampire couldn't travel over salt water. 
It is believed in many places that vampires and other supernatural beings cannot cross salt water, so the villagers must have thought that to transfer a berry, a corpse, on an island would be more than enough to stop the vampire attacks. If the historians and scientists are right, then somewhere off the coast of Lesbos lies the real vampire island and the location of the world's first vampire cemetery. Newton wrote these words about 140 years ago, and we've been wondering what the Greeks did with their vampires beside bury them locally. And finding this passage suggested that we found out where they went over there to this little island off the village of Pamphila. From the shore, it's almost impossible to see any evidence of burials. So there's only one thing for it. Hector is going to take to the skies. We've just taken off from Mytilene International Airport. We're heading due north to the island of Pamphila. We're about to come up on the island now, so things should start getting interesting. We're going to drop to about 500 feet, 150 meters. It may be a little bumpy, but we'll get a good view of the top of the island that way. We're going to circle around the island uh, and look. You can see there's remains of a small building here on the north side. There are foundations of what looks like a basement a little bit further east of it. Could these be the burial sites? Places that may contain structures underground? We have been able to pick out the lines of several buildings, uh, foundations that indicate there are buried structures on the island. worth coming back with ground penetrating radar and getting further details of the graves. Who knows what he'll find. For now, Hector must wait, his curiosity wetted and replete in the knowledge that he may have discovered a world first, a graveyard for the undead, the real vampire island. Hector's research has confirmed beyond doubt that vampires once roamed the island of Lesbos. People assume that vampires are, are a myth, but the Central European Balkan vampire uh, evolved in a, in a particular way uh, that has fascinated people since the 18th century. Thanks to modern forensics, medicine and science, we now know that vampires were real people. Outcasts from society, stricken with disease, deformities, or mental illness. He must have been an outcast, and this is why he was treated as a vampire after he died. And even today, in some parts of the world, vampires are still regarded as a very real threat. One of the most alluring and enduring of all supernatural beings. <laughs> 